Good morning, people of God. Today's scripture reading is from 1 John and Matthew. It'll be 1 John 4, verses 7 to 21, and then we'll turn to the Gospel of Matthew. If you're able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? 1 John 4, 721 says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we are able to abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected in us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because he is also, we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now we can look at Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. It says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he re refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he re refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. This is the word of the Lord. Take your Bible, if you will, and turn to Galatians chapter 2. We're going to pick up today at verse 11. 
I, I want to begin sharing a couple thoughts and, and have a prayer. Um, uh, all of us, I'm sure, are aware what happened last evening as uh, former President Trump was holding a rally in Pennsylvania and uh, there was an attempt to take his life and uh, I believe God spared him uh, that he only took a bullet uh, to his ear that was meant certainly for his head and uh, so we want to give thanks to God the scripture is clear that we are to obey those who are in leadership over us in terms of government we are to obey the authorities. We are to pay our taxes. To the one that pa taxes are due, we should pay. To the one that revenue is due, they should receive. And so we're called and commanded by Scripture to, to come under the authorities over us. In Romans 13, it actually says that we should obey them because these are men, these are people who are carrying out the purposes of God. Now you say, wait a minute, what if somebody's not, they're not good, that they're, they're making decisions that are wrong, evil. God's purposes include putting people in authority who are not going to make the right decisions because God does judge us. There are times where judgment, the Old Testament, God did that all the time. He raised up wicked kings to bring uh, chastisement to his people. So regardless of what you think about uh, the left or the right, who should be president, uh, let, me, let me just tell you something. As believers, our first and foremost priority is to believe in God as the authority over all. God is the authority over all. In fact, uh, in Isaiah chapter 40, Listen to what it says. Do you not know? Do you not, do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. There's no president. There's no prime minister. There's no king. There's God. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. God's over everything. He is sovereign over everything. What happened last night, believe me, that was not a surprise to God. You cannot surprise God. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. The creator of the earth and of earth, and uh, creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might. He increases strength. Every youth, should, uh, every youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We as believers put our hope and our trust in God and God alone. He is the answer for every nation on the earth. And yes, I do want God to bless America, but you know what? Blessings sometimes come through, comes through great pain and sacrifice. Whatever God wishes, but I am so thankful that 
that uh, former President Trump did not lose his life last night. I believe, again, he was spared by the Lord. For what cause? Only the Lord knows. And I believe more in God than I believe in President Trump or President Biden. Somebody might ask, why don't you have a full, and somebody did ask me, why don't, why don't you have the American flag on your stage? Put the Christian flag on one side and the American flag on the other. I'll tell you why. Because we're not here to worship the United States. Look, I'm as patriotic as the next. If there was a war and I was a 20-year-old guy, I'd go off and fight for my country. I believe in my country. But when it comes to the worship of God, nothing else comes before God. This is a house of worship, worship of God. Amen? So let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we know that the media will spin this event in so many different directions, and they will have their talking points and try to just bombard our minds with what they want to say, both those on the left and those on the right. But Father, we pray that you would remind us each and every day, that this is your universe that you created, not even with your hands, you spoke it into existence. And Father, you will fulfill your purposes on this earth. And so while we have a, an allegiance to the country that we belong, and we are called by Scripture to come under the authority of those in power, yet you are the ultimate power. And so today we give you thanks for the protection of former President Trump. We pray for the protection of our president, Joe Biden. We pray that, God, you would raise up in Congress a revival. It might be just a few people who truly fear you. They say the right words, but they don't necessarily live it. But, Father, we pray that a revival would break out in Congress and that they would turn their hearts back to you Repent of their sin and lead this nation so that once again, this is a nation blessed by God. We pray it in Jesus' name, Lord. And we pray that now, Father, you would focus our attention on our own hearts. The greatest way to turn a nation is for each and every heart to change. Start with us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're in the study of Galatians. We've been here now for a few weeks. We do have little books in the back. Somebody can show you at the welcome table there. Uh, the little, it's a, like a notebook for Galatians that you can write your own thoughts in, but it also has the scripture in the ESV. Feel free to use those if you haven't already. And uh, let me also just say something. Uh, we're, we're still trying to work through the summer with the AC and all. If you sit over here, this is the cool side. I don't mean cool people. Okay, okay yeah, they're cool people. But, but it's cooler on this side of the, the room than this side. So if you get cold easy, you need to transition over here. If you get hot easy, you need to transition over here. And, and it'll work that way for you. Uh, so we're hoping that everybody can find comfortability. I almost was tempted at the beginning of the service to come up and say, hey, let's all greet one another and explain what I just said and say, and after your greeting, go ahead and shift. Make your shift. And some of you are saying, boy, Pastor Greg, I wish you would. Um, but no, we're not going to at this point. It's, we're too far in the service. But, uh, but next week, you know, just so you know, I warned you. All right. Well, let's get into the Word of God. Uh, in Galatians chapter 2, this letter to the Galatian churches that is located in the region of Asia Minor is a wonderful study on the doctrine of justification by faith. This is a, a foundational doctrine of the Christian faith, justification by faith. The reason Paul addresses the Galatians with this doctrine is on Christ alone, faith alone, is because the Christian faith hangs on it. Uh, if you take away justification by faith, then you are left with a man-centered gospel. Justification by faith means you didn't do nothing to save yourself. You did not participate in your salvation. You surrendered to Jesus Christ. You repented of your sins 
And by faith, you believed in his perfect work that he paid on the, on the cross for you to forgive you of your sins. This is a paramount doctrine in the faith. Now, the reason Paul wrote this letter was because false teachers, uh, we call them Judaizers. They are literally people who are in the church. The early church started on, in Acts chapter 2, and these folks came into the church. And they, they uh, to some degree, said they believed in Jesus as, as the Messiah. Only they mixed it, they made a cocktail. They syncretistically said, yeah, Christ is the Savior, but they said, if you're not a Jew, you need to be circumcised for salvation to occur. So it's Jesus and that's how you're saved. Well, there is no and. And Paul, in all of his letters, reinforces the fact that it's, it's by faith alone through Christ. Christ alone that we're saved. Amen? Important to understand that. There's nothing, listen, so let's, let's, let's ferret that out, okay? Flesh it out right now. So that means you coming to church every Sunday plays no part in your salvation. Your good works on this earth play zero part in your salvation. When Jesus went to the cross, he paid for all your sins past present and future and God poured out on Jesus wrath judgment anger and Jesus took all of it from the father on your behalf on my behalf therefore when he said it is finished the sin debt has been fully paid and he died on the cross. There's nothing left for you to do than to believe in him and that work that he performed on the cross. I want you to understand that these folks came into the church and now they, they're Jews who they say they're saved. But they're pushing circumcision. They're push, pushing that they still need to hold to the strict dietary laws of Judaism. So they come, they leave Jerusalem, they go up to Antioch in Syria, and there they enter the church as though they are part of the church. But they start pushing this agenda. They eat differently than the Gentiles. They don't eat with the Gentiles. This is after they're supposedly saved. Still divisions going on inside the church. And, and that's what's happening here. The, the, they have placed this yoke. They're wanting to place a yoke over the people in the church in Antioch who have been called into freedom through Jesus Christ, right? You, you've been set free from the bondage of sin when, you, when you're saved. You're not called into bondage or legalism. You're called out of that nonsense. So I, I want you to think of yeast being added to a lump of dough. What does it do? Well, it works its way through all of the dough. And, and in a spiritual sense, yeast is, speaks of sin. And, and so what happens is when you put yeast in dough, it corrupts the dough. Uh, this is something that, that was happening. They were bringing this yeast. Jesus even spoke of the yeast of the Pharisees. We'll talk about that in just a second. But they were trying to bring Old Testament law into the New Testament covenant of the blood of Christ being washed or poured over us, cleansing us. And when I say blood of Christ, I don't mean his literal blood. I mean the work of the cross where he died, where he bled and died. So they're trying to bring Old Testament into the New Testament. They, how? By the cutting of the, of the covenant, circumcision. And that's what God set up for the Israelites 
to have covenant with him. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. They had to have bloodshed. So he said, you will sh- as men, you will, you will shed blood, circumcision. And that's how you enter into covenant with me. But even that covering, it never redeemed the Old Testament Jews from their sin. It just covered it. You're like putting a blanket over it so you can't see it. Because the Old Testament is a picture of of something that is still hidden. You have all these types, all these examples, all these symbols of something. But you really don't fully understand the mystery behind it until you get to the New Testament, where now we find out that the Old Testament was the shadow of, of what Jesus would bring in the New Testament. The New Testament, Jesus himself, is the substance. You go from living a life in a shadow to living life fully and freely in Jesus Christ. And these guys are calling them back into the shadow. And that's what's happening here. Paul is going to address a matter in our text head on. In letter form, he, he, he speaks to it quickly, early in the letter, chapter 2. Take Galatians chapter, uh, well, he even started talking about it in chapter 1. Look back at chapter 1, just turn back to chapter 1, verse 6. You can, you can see this. Paul, I mean, Paul is livid. He is sideways on this. He's really upset that the, the Galatians, the believers in the churches of Galatia, were now being influenced by these false teachers with a, a heretical teaching. He said, verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. You're deserting grace and are turning to a different gospel. And look what he says, not that there is another one, You're turning to a different gospel, even though there is no other gospel. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's the yeast. They're bringing yeast. They want to put it in the dough. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Paul's laying it down. He's saying, listen, I'm going to tell you something. I received the gospel that I'm preaching from Jesus Christ. He revealed it to me. And I'm telling you right now, if any man gives you any other version of a gospel other than what I'm preaching, even an angel in heaven, let them be cursed. Anathema. Verse 9, as we have uh, said before, now I say again, I, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now, remember, whenever something is repeated in the Hebrew understanding of communication, when it's repeated, that's emphasis. That's bold print. That's something that's highlighted. Jesus would often say, verily, verily, I say to you. He's emphasizing. Here, Paul emphasizes. I'm telling you right now, there is no other gospel. And he made it very clear in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. This was not my gospel. This is not a man-given gospel. I didn't come up with this concept. Jesus himself gave me this gospel. And these guys have come in and they're perverting it. Either to to take from it something that's not there. That's called eisegesis. It's when a pastor or a preacher will take a text and he will commit eisegesis. He will take out of the text what's not in the text. Now, why you say, why would a preacher ever do that? Because it's not about the text. It's about his point that he wants to make. So he's found some cute story to tell. Now, what scripture will support that story? Hmm, let me think. And he cherry picks Bible verses. No, no. We're to exegete the text. Take out, exit from the text what God intended to be taken. 
these guys are coming and they're saying, no, there's more. See, you can, you can, you can uh, change the gospel by taking out. You can also change it by putting in. These guys are adding to. There's more than just what Jesus did for us on the cross. You also need to follow the, the Old Testament Mosaic law, some, some of it. So Paul reinforces this statement of truth by recalling his own journey to Jerusalem where he spent 15 days with Peter, the apostle, and then he spent uh, time with the, the other apostles, James and John and Peter, all three of them together. He recalled with this group his travels and how he shared the gospel and how Gentiles were coming to Jesus and he explained to them what the gospel was that he was preaching and they listened and they said, we agree with you. It was the same gospel that God had given them. So they're all in one accord. He went to Jerusalem, met with the big boys and he did say, he, he said, I'm gonna meet with these influential spiritual leaders although they're not influential to me, meaning God doesn't show any partiality. I'm not going to show partiality. But I'm going to go and I'm going to submit to them because they are in leadership. The role is over me, and I'm going to go and... And he goes and he shares, and guess what? They said, you're right. This gospel that you received is from the Lord. It confirmed what Paul was preaching. So, so he... He has this very clear understanding of the gospel. And he's been preaching this gospel. Now let's turn to our text, look at verse 11. Because Paul adds to his defense of the gospel by recalling an incident that took place in the church in Antioch. And the church in Antioch is the first Gentile church registered in scripture after the Disipora. Uh, the Jews were spread out from even outside of Jerusalem, even further into the Gentile world. And the church in Antioch was the first. That would be in Syria, which would be no, just north of, of Jerusalem and Judea and Galilee in that region. And so the, they settled there, Jews settled there, but also Gentiles in the region, because that is a Gentile land in Syria. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God's poured out and people get saved mightily. It's just incredible what's going on. And, and what happened was it, was, it came back to the apostles in Jerusalem, what was happening in, in, Syria, in uh, Antioch, and they sent Barnabas. Go check it out. Barnabas goes up, sees the work of God, how God's bringing Jew and Gentile together as one through the gospel. And by the way, that's what makes all of this identity crap that we see today all this talk about black and white and asian and all the separating of people groups every bit of that is a frontal assault to the gospel of jesus christ any preacher who speaks against certain groups of people he is absolutely going against what the gospel teaches antioch's the best example all kinds of people are in Antioch. All kinds. And they're all one. It's beautiful. Barnabas sees it, and he makes a beeline for Tarsus, finds the apostle Paul. He says, you need to come to Antioch. They go there, and they spend a whole year teaching the church in Antioch the truth from the Scripture, the Old Testament, of who Jesus is. And just reinforcing these doctrines on, on salvation. So this is a beautiful time. Well, in the midst of that time, you're now reading in the text what Paul experienced while he was in Antioch. So verse 11 says, when, but when Cephas came to Antioch. Now, I don't want you to be thrown off course by the name Cephas. Uh, there, there seems to be some confusion over the various names used for the same person. The first mention of Peter was in John chapter 1, verse 40, where Jesus meets Simon. His name was Simon, which is his Jewish name. And, and, and Jesus meets Simon and changes his name to Cephas in the Aramaic. Cephas, or... Peter in the Greek. It's 
So he changes his name from Simon to Peter. They both mean rock, okay? Whether you say Cephas or Peter. In Paul's writing, sometimes he refers to Peter as Cephas, other times as, as Peter. Uh, he's also called Simeon at times, um, uh, but his name was Simon. Um, now that I have utterly confused you, let's continue. Verse 11, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically, along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So let's break this down. Paul calls Peter out for a sin that was leading other believers into sin. Sin is always, listen church, sin is always a serious threat to the church of Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. Satan knows how to pinpoint which arrows to send where. And he will use sin as much as he can, work it into the church to corrupt the church, okay? So this is a serious matter. Sin is always a serious threat. As Jesus was walking with his disciples, he said to them, in Matthew 16, 6, Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They thought he was speaking about bread because they were hungry when he talked about leaven, And they're thinking he's speaking of literal bread because they'd forgot to bring anything on their journey. But he was referring to the false teaching of the Pharisees. In Galatians 5, 9, further, if you go forward in Galatians, Paul said a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You can't have a little sin come into the church and it only remain in that one little spot or part of the church. It will permeate through the whole church. Just a little yeast will corrupt the entire lump of dough. So the false teachings of the Judaizers was corrupting. They came to corrupt the entire church. So Paul goes into protect mode. He is a spiritual shepherd. For one year, he and Barnabas are the shepherds, working probably with the leadership of the church. But they are there for a purpose. We're gonna, there's, there's two things, if I could say this about pastoral ministry. A pastoral ministry should be con, con, uh, uh, combined, it's a co- combination of two things. One, it is lovingly feeding the flock of God. No shepherd is, is, is those sheep do not belong to him. They belong to God. And he is not the shepherd. He is an under-shepherd to Jesus Christ, who is the great good shepherd. Amen? So his, number one, a good shepherd will lovingly feed the flock of God. Secondly, a good shepherd will lovingly protect the flock. Jesus actually spoke about this very thing. And he said that if, if, if the wolf comes to the fold to take sheep, a, a good shepherd will lay down his life to protect the sheep. By, by the way, in Australia, that's where more sheep are raised than any other part of the earth. And the shepherds in Australia, you, if you just go in, home and do a Google search on shepherds and dangers of shepherds, you'll find that there's all kinds of wild beasts and animals that are trying to get to the sheep. And many shepherds are maimed by animals as they protect the sheep. Some lose their life protecting sheep. It's a, God knew exactly what he was doing when he chose to call his body a flock of sheep and the pastor's shepherds. So a a good shepherd will feed the flock 
and protect the flock. By the way, you do both of those first and foremost primarily through the Bible, teaching the Bible. When you teach the Bible, you're feeding, and when you teach the Bible, you're giving them fair warning and discernment so that they can be protected. When a church focuses on anything other, a preacher focuses on all these other things that people want him to be and do, and that he has taken on, he's the CEO, he's this, he's that, whatever. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible wants a shepherd of a flock to smell like the sheep by the end of the day. He cares about sheep. His life is given to the sheep. Paul is given to the church at Antioch for that year. He is fully vested in the work that God's given him to do. And so he's there and he's, he's providing and he's trying to, to shepherd the flock well. He wants to provide purity. He's trying to get rid of the, the corruption and bring the church into purity. He identifies the sin. What is the sin that he identifies? Hypocrisy. The rest of the Jews, verse 13, acted hypocritically along with him. Who? Peter. One of the apostles of Jesus Christ was being a hypocrite. Paul saw it, and Paul lovingly called it out. So he, it was so bad, the hypocrisy was so bad, that even Barnabas, Paul's partner in the ministry, was taken by it, and he became hypocritical. This is a real issue. The Greek word for hypocrite refers to an actor who would wear a mask to portray a different character than their own. In the, in the theater, when it first came out, hypocrite, it was not a bad thing. You're actually tr supposed to become a different character. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what the hypocrite means. But now, all of a sudden, uh, Scripture refers to someone as a hypocrite who will mask their true character by pretending to be someone they are not. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 again, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Stop putting on a face when you go to temple to offer your offering or when you go to offer prayers. For then, Jesus said, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. See, that's the whole motivation behind becoming a hypocrite. So people will like me. So people will think more highly of me. So when I go in certain circles, I put on a certain mask, and I look like I belong to them. And because of that, they receive me. It, what, what's really going on is, you are fearing man more than you fear God. Rather than stand on the truth of God with all the people in the church, you'd rather sneak around and put on a different mask for different people so that more people will like you. That's what these guys were doing when they came up from, from Jerusalem. They, their goal was to get the people to like them, to trust them. In Peter's case, he was committed to the gospel of grace. We know that because he was part of the council in Jerusalem that accepted what Paul said about the gospel. Plus, Peter had his own encounter where he saw what God did by, in a vision. And he knew that the gospel included the Gentiles. But he got in front of a certain crowd of people that impressed him whatever it was, and he became like them. These Jewish legalists, let's talk about them for a second. They, is, they said they were sent by James, James being the brother of Jesus, who was probably the head or lead pastor of all the elders in Jerusalem. 
We know that because in Acts 15, when they all gathered, Peter and Paul and James and all the others, and they talked about this idea of circumcision of the flesh, they all shared their experiences, and then it ended with, with uh, James saying let, he gave the final word. So he probably held that kind of a position. So when they come up to Antioch, they're saying, well, we're sent by James. There's no way. While James did participate in certain uh, mosaic practices after becoming a believer, he wasn't consistent with it. Only at times, but not with circumcision for the Gentile. He clearly, that was the judgment he gave. In fact, uh, you you can see that in Acts chapter 15. Go ahead and turn there, if you will, please. Let's take a look at this, Acts 15. Verse 19, this is the outcome of the council meeting to discuss what kind of yoke the Jews would put on the Gentiles for salvation. Therefore, my judgment, this is James now, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols. How many of you know that that's wrong today? You shouldn't go and worship idols and do things with idols that will cause other people to stumble. Let me make it, break it down. Let me flesh it out here. So there's nothing wrong with watching an NFL football game. But if that's all you ever talk about, It's probably an idol to you and a stumbling block for other believers. So that's a very healthy thing that he said. And from sexual immorality, I think we all know, we don't have to say a whole lot about that, and from what has been strangled and from blood. And then look at verse verse 22 of the same chapter, Acts 15. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are in the Gentiles, are, are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions. James did not tell those men to go up there, they were lying. It has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So let me also add that Peter had already given up all the Mosaic practices, the dietary law, which was very strict. Peter was no longer doing that. Let me give you the passages. We're not going to read them, but Acts chapter 10, verse 9 through 22. And James had a time, uh, at at times, held only to some of those practices in Acts 21, 18 through 26. This this was a period, by the way, of transition. The book of Acts is a book of transition. You go from the Gospels where Jesus is the spiritual leader to the book of Acts where Jesus has now proclaimed that the the disciples would lead the church. 
He said to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So, so it go, then it goes from, a, in, in the book of Acts, it goes from the apostles who are leading the church to the elders who are leading the church. In the beginning of uh, Acts, it's about the apostles. At the, by the end, it's about the elders. And that's what we have today. So, so there's a transition. So these men who used to walk with Jesus, and while Jesus was on the earth, they still practiced Judaism. Jesus had not gone and died yet. The new covenant had not been established in his blood, so they were still watching their dietary laws and doing things. And, and, and then Jesus dies on the cross. Now he ascends. They are in control. Little by little, they started working their way away from the Mosaic law. Because Jesus told them that he's fulfillment of it, meaning I'm the continuation of it. No longer do you have to go back to the, subs- to the shadow, you've got the substance. But it was hard for them to make these changes. This was their life at one point. So both Peter and James. But God dealt with Peter, right? He, he, he dealt with Peter regarding that. Peter was on his way to Joppa. And, and Peter's... Uh, He's the apostle who was called to bring the gospel to the Jews. And you kind of had a funny thing about the Gentiles. He, okay, yeah, I'm, I question whether you can be saved. And God showed him a sheet coming out of heaven with all manner of animal on it. I mean, every kind of beast you can imagine. And all of it was unclean to a Jew. It's not kosher. And God said, take and eat. And he's like, no way, Lord. He's shocked by that. I'm not going to eat that. And God's three times God had to say it. And he said, what I have said is clean, is clean. You can eat it. And then all of a sudden, he gets a knock at the door, and a man says, hey, you're supposed to come with me. God came to me in a vision and said, I'm supposed to come get you and take you to a a centurion's house named Cornelius, a Gentile. So Peter follows him, gets to the house, And the next day, the whole house and everybody in the neighborhood, all the Gentiles have filled the house. And Peter makes the statement, I now know, God revealed to me, that salvation is for the Gentile, just as it's for the Jew. So Peter knows better. He knows better. So... What caused Peter, when these guys show up from Jerusalem, what caused Peter to stop eating with the Gentiles, hanging out with his brothers in Christ, and then only hang out with this group and eat the dietary standards that they're following? Why the, what happened? What causes you and I? to mask our true identity when we hang out with certain people? Here's the answer. I said it earlier. We fear man more than we fear God. I've pastored churches for uh, quite a few years, and I'm going to tell you that that temptation is very real. And when you're in a large church, It's really hard to avoid that temptation because the people in leadership are looking to you to be what they want you to be. And they probably don't have a real clear understanding of what the Bible says that you're called to be. And you can say it as many times as you want, but that's the problem in the church today. The church is run like a business It's more an organization than it is a community of believers. And pastors get sucked into it. And sometimes they're the ones that cause it. The fear of man rather than the fear of God. But here's what I have to remind myself of and I have for years. I keep coming back to this. One day, that sky is going to split open and Jesus is going to appear. And time will end. And I will answer to God as a shepherd of the flock. Scripture says that those who teach will be held to a higher standard. I'm not going to stand before a man. 
I'm not going to stand before a spiritual leadership board of a church. I'm not going to stand before a church council. I'm not going to stand before a leadership council. I'm going to stand before God and give account for how and why I shepherded the flock the way I did. The same is for you, though. You might not be held to a teaching accountability, but you will give answer for why. You feared man more than you feared the truth of the gospel. You say, Pastor, how can you say that? When was the last time you shared the gospel? Why haven't you? Oftentimes, it's the fear of man. Sometimes it's just selfish living. It's an assault to the gospel. Everybody in this church that's truly saved is called by God to share the gospel. You might want to write this down. I'm going to share it with you. I learned this many years ago. I try to practice it. Sometimes I fall flat on my face, but it's still right, and it's still the standard that I want to live by. Behavior is a function of belief. Let me say it a different way. The way you behave is the way you believe. We can say to people, Oh, I believe in God. I believe in the gospel. I believe in the Bible. Does your behavior reflect that? The truth is, we behave the way we truly believe. Maybe some of us find that, man, my behavior is so far from what the Bible teaches. You've gotten caught up in hypocrisy. You come to church, you hang out with Christian folk, and you ask, act a certain way. Then you go back to the sales floor, you go back to the, the school, whatever you do, go back into the neighborhood, and you live differently. The word believe in the Greek means live by. When it says Abraham lived by God, it means That's how he behaved. He truly believed God. How else would he get up and leave the land of his people, leave his farm, leave all of his livestock, leave everything to follow God's command? He lived what he believed. We're called to the same standard. We can totally make the same mistake as Peter. When it says he feared the party of the circumcised, it means he held them in higher esteem than other members of the church, namely the Gentiles. When he was hanging out with the Jews, he acted like the Jews who were still caught up in legalism. When he was hanging out with the Gentiles and the Jews weren't around, then he walked in the freedom of Christ. He was two-faced. He was double-minded. James, the brother of Jesus, said, if you're double-minded, don't expect God to give you anything. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You got to be single-minded. You can't have two heads walking around. Be the same person everywhere you go. You ever met somebody like that? They're the same no matter what what setting, who they're with. You have to admire them because it means that they will not be intimidated by man. They're not concerned about fitting in. They're secure in their identity. You have an identity in Christ. You can't have a greater identity on the earth than that. And that should give you all the security you need to go and walk amongst all different kinds of people and be the same person. 
never changed. That in itself is a witness of the work of Jesus Christ in you. Amen? You're literally living out the gospel. Now you just need to open your mouth. When you know someone is caught in a sin, you know, Paul approached Peter immediately when he saw the hypocrisy, confronted him. So when you know somebody's caught in a sin, how do you respond? Do you simply pull back and say, well, somebody's going to talk to them about that? And you don't say anything, but you do walk around grumbling about it? Do you fear how the person will respond to you? So instead of powering up and going in love and saying, hey, brother, I've got to talk to you about this. Or do you just kind of cower and walk away because of, I just want to keep the peace. He's my friend, and if I say something, it might end our friendship. What kind of a friendship is that? where you tolerate sin. Thirdly, do you go to your friend and gossip about it while you do nothing? So how do you respond when somebody's caught in a sin? Here's something to ponder. It says, if it's true that our behavior is a product of our beliefs, then what does your behavior say about your truth? You can't say, I believe the Bible, and then behave differently than someone who is committed to living the truth because you're a hypocrite. So you've got to be honest and truthful with the person. True love. You know, Maureen shared in the very beginning in the Bible text that she read for us from 1 John, we're to love one another. If you truly love somebody, you don't, you don't tolerate sin with them. You love them more than that. I want the best for them. And when I see them going in the wrong direction, I want to help them. I also want to love the church and keep the church from having that kind of sin come in and permeate and cause corruption in the church. Scripture says in Galatians 6, 1, Paul said, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. First of all, don't go to somebody arrogantly, because you too could fall in this, that same sin or another sin, and you probably have. So when you come to them, you come humbly, out of love, tenderness. Hey, brother... Do you know I love you? Yeah, I know you love me. I need to share something with you. And you can even ask the question, is what I think I'm seeing really happening? Be honest with me. I'm your friend and I love you. You lovingly confront them. Brother, that's going to destroy you. It's going to destroy those in your life. It's going to destroy others. And more than anything, it's a great harm to the church. That's a friend. I'm glad that all through my life I've had men like that in my life who did not fear me because I was the pastor. They loved me as their pastor. And they could come to me humbly, lovingly, tenderly, carefully and talk to me. Thank God for those men. Those are my heroes. Those who didn't have a double standard. They lived it. And they called me to it when I was a young man. Praise God for that. No, I've never, some of you in your minds, did Pastor Greg have a moral failure? No, I did not. But if I think for a second that I'm above it, that's when it could happen. I'm not better than anybody else, and nobody else is better than me. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. We're sinners that desperately need a Savior. And once we're saved by Christ and the Holy Spirit comes in, now we have a responsibility to one another. That's what it means to belong to a body, to be part of a community, a flock, is to care for each other. You see somebody who's hurting, you go and you minister. You pray before church, after with people that you see. You go and visit. You take a meal. We've got some, oh, what a wonderful church. 
when something happens in someone's life, people are quick. Look, can I bring a meal? And, and, and I just love that about you. I want everybody to get in on that. That's what it means to belong. Get your behavior in alignment with what you truly believe. And if it doesn't happen, then I pray God sends a Paul to you who calls you out. Paul's like, dude, you're not going to pull that nonsense here. We've been working here for a year with these folks. You're, you're assaulting the grace of God in the gospel. Amen? Tough message, isn't it? Tough for us to hear as a body and individually because no doubt every one of us, the Holy Spirit is pulling up areas. I was talking to the men's in the Wednesday morning men's ministry meeting or Bible study this week and I said, isn't it amazing? You have that feeling when you're, when you're being obedient to God in an area of your life that you've, that you've overcome and you're feeling good about it and you're like, man, you know. And, and, and while you're feeling good about it, the Holy Spirit what about over here? I need you to stop praising yourself. I need you to come over here. We got a lot of work to do. How many of you say amen to that? He's always working. Why? To conform you to the image of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your love. A love that is so pure that it will call us out of sin. I'm thankful, Lord, that through salvation, Jesus, you did what I could never do. And as long as I'm clothed in this flesh and blood, I'm going to fall short. But it's not because of my works that I am at peace with you. It is because of your Son's work in my behalf. I pray that the body can rest in that, rest in their salvation that comes by grace through faith, Christ alone, faith alone. But Lord, we also pray that you would give us subtle reminders this week that we belong to the body of Jesus Christ. And that means we are to care for each other. And caring doesn't just mean helping somebody who's hurting it also means lovingly confronting someone who has fallen into a sin. Oh God, thank you that the gospel brings us into oneness. It is only sin that tries to separate us from each other. When discord is sown in the heart of a church and people begin to take sides and schisms start up, none of that is the work of the gospel. It's just the work of man. So, Father, may we be more aware of it, and may we do our part to live the way we believe, and may we continue to grow in what we believe. In Jesus' name. Stand, if you will, please. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you to blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before, now, and forever. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord.